any talk that has the title of all about UK boarding schools is obviously going to be a bit of a skim across the surface. And if there are particular areas that you are interested in, either get in contact straight away on the, um, on, on the chat button and type in questions as we go along or at the end. And likewise, get in touch with us um, afterwards if, if that can be of help. Um, firstly, a big thank you to Phil and the team at Baker and Bloom for uh, setting all of this up. And um, well, let's get going. Now, my background is as a classroom teacher. That's, that's where I started. I started working um, in the UK independent school sector, mainly because it allowed me to also um, coach rowing, which I was um, slightly addicted to when I was at university. But I've taught in, in a number of, of schools, both day schools and boarding schools. Um, I, uh, for many years, I was a member of the interview panel for uh, geography at Oxford University. And I suppose the most relevant part of this is that I was registrar for admissions at the King's School in Canterbury for over 10 years. Now, it was during that period that a, a number of us with, within the, um, the same work area decided that it was time to move away from viewing each other as uh, competitors and to really set up a registrar's conference and get together much more and try to understand what we were doing as colleagues and learn in terms of um, best practice from one another. And that led to me as one of the more senior uh, registrars in, in the boarding world. It led to me getting a very good understanding of the other boarding schools and indeed of my colleagues working in these schools, many of whom, of course, are, are still um, doing that particular job. Um, UK boarding schools, well, uh, this, this slide tells you just some facts and figures. There are over 470 schools that offer boarding of, of some sort or another. Now, Mostly, I'm dealing with those that um, have a majority of where, where the majority of pupils are boarders. And so you can see here that there are over 120 schools that um, where 50% where of the pupils or more are boarding. There are just 13 schools that are 100% boarding. But that's not particularly surprising when you think even a school like Charterhouse, which has, uh, which is over 95% boarding, will have a number of day pupils, perhaps um, uh, children of members of staff or even local um, uh, pupils who just didn't want to board but wanted to be at the school. And when I'm advising families on schools and, and, and what they sh should consider, I tend to focus on those schools where I feel there will be a very strong boarding ethos and, and where the, uh, the children coming in from abroad will be mixing with a very large group of boarders and where the schools essentially run on a seven day week programme. E even those that emphasise five day week boarding, there are uh, quite a number of them that actually um, have a very good program on over the weekends. But obviously those where the majority of pupils are boarding, they tend to have Saturday morning school, they tend to have Saturday afternoon sport. Sundays are usually pretty busy as well. So the uh, individual pupils have a very, very full timetable. Now, the, the nature of boarding, as I've hinted at, can vary from full seven day week boarding right down to what is termed flexi boarding, which is generally of little interest to overseas parents, but also the schools offer the possibility of either A-levels or the international baccalaureate. Now, A-levels are the sort of the UK standard, and that is what is most common at UK schools. The IB is offered uh, by a smaller number of schools, and there are actually very few that offer the IB only. 
uh, or exclusively offer the IB. Most of the schools that offer the IB also offer A-levels. And, and so that is a conversation as well that at some point of the process, if you are interested in, in your um, son or daughter going to a UK boarding school, that is something to consider as well. Now, lots of parents are struggling with this whole idea of, well, that's fine. There are lots and lots of schools. There are, you've already told us, there are over 100 that offer, uh, that, that are more than 50% boarding. So how do you pick your way through this very large number? How do you select the, the right school for your son or your daughter? Now, when Karen did her, her talk um, last week, it's, it's very obvious that the American schools have a very clear mission statement. The UK schools, if it's a mission statement, it's a little bit hidden. Uh, sometimes there are very clear uh, statements on the website. Sometimes they're a bit hidden in the text. But if you go through to their websites and have a look at what they are saying, you will get an idea as to what type of school it actually is, and also what type of pupil they're actually hoping to get into the school. Now, Winchester College, I, I've just chosen four here at random, four schools that I know very well. Winchester College is probably one of the most selective boys schools uh, in the world. It is very definitely um, uh, a high caliber intellectual environment. And it is absolutely right when they state that they celebrate the individual. And when I come across um, a, a very individual pupil, one who perhaps could be um, thought of as being a bit quirky and, and who is very clever, then Winchester should come into my mind at a particular point. Rugby school, this is a photograph of rugby school that I have here. Um, they emphasize the whole person, the whole point. Now, I think Winchester would argue that they certainly educate the whole person as well. But I think what rugby are saying is that perhaps they are more uh, a more inclusive um, uh, environment and they really do. They don't want to focus just simply on the intellectual capacity of an individual pupil. They want to look at the, uh, the whole of this particular character and they want to educate this whole person as well. Wickham Abbey, uh, which is um, a girls school from 11 to 18, not quite 100% boarding but pretty close. Uh, right on the front page they emphasize academic excellence and again that's not surprising, they are an academically selective school. And, and they will always be completely honest about that. And the, uh, their whole selection uh, procedure when it comes to um, choosing pupils for the school is to try to make sure that any individual girl will actually be happy in that academically selective environment. And then of course, once, once we have sorted all of that out, we're looking at the other areas <clears throat> that they want to emphasize. They talk about empathy, they talk, talk about integrity. Benenden School, another girls school, again, perhaps slightly, well, definitely slightly less um, selective at the point of entry, but uh, another wonderful boarding school is just actually uh, taking a number of day pupils in this year for the first time. And they talk again about this complete education. And I think, again, I would argue that they are probably uh, more inclusive, that they are not going to be as academically selective. So you will pick up on ideas when you look at uh, their particular websites. But obviously, a lot of people will look at academic league tables. Now, I think these should come with a huge, huge health warning. Um, these are very easy. It, 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 it's, a very, it's a very easy way of listing schools. Rank them top to bottom according to their academic results. Now, I have taught in schools that have been right at the very top of league tables. I have taught at schools that have been much, much further down. And I don't believe that my teaching got any better or any worse, depending upon where I was positioned in any given league tables. 
also one one of the um, reasons why a school will be very high in the league tables is simply that they will be highly selective at the point of entry. I remember my um, my wonderful head of department, terrific mentor, when I taught at King's College School in Wimbledon, one of the most highly ranked um, schools, a day school in London. Um, I was, I was feeling very pleased when my A-level group had all got uh, A grades these in the, in the days before A stars. And Colin just uh, said to me, Rory, he said, remember these boys were very clever at the point of entry and they're still very clever when they leave. Well, so, so how, how do I recommend that people actually use league tables? I think the first thing to do is try to work out what is the academic level of your particular son or daughter. And if your son or daughter could be seen to be in the top 10, 5% um, within an area like Hong Kong, then you can be pretty certain that that individual child would be able to cope with a school that is very, very high up in the league tables. But if, you're, if your child is somewhere midway in their uh, school, perhaps midway in their year group, then I wouldn't be as selective. And I would look at schools that I thought matched his or her academic ability. There is nothing worse than being that uh, adolescent uh, boy or girl who's always running just to keep up with the tail end of their school um, year group. And I've seen that on quite a number of occasions where, where children have been genuinely unhappy because they have felt that they, they can't keep up. And then they end up feeling like failures, even though they may well be doing, you know, incredibly well. I think achieving and being happy achieving is very, very important in the lives of young people. And I think it is very important for us, for, for you as parents, for me as somebody that guides parents, to make sure that we guide these uh, boys and girls towards schools that will actually suit them. I mean, one, one other thing that you should con consider when you're um, looking at league tables, if for instance, your boy or girl was applying to the sixth form and they wanted to study particular subjects, rather than look at the overall league tables, it might be more interesting to look at the results in those particular subjects in particular schools that, that you're focusing on. Looking at the numbers taking those subjects, are there quite a few? So there'll be a good cohort going through um, do they do reasonably well compared to the other subjects? So I think just bold, bare league tables on their own are not hugely useful, but they can certainly be there somewhere to help guide us. And so on to the whole business of assessment. Now at age, th this, first of all, let's just deal with 11 plus and 13 plus. For many schools, there is a, a lead in time of anything up to three years. So if you are looking to target one of the very top boys schools, for instance, you need to be thinking about it at age nine for entry at age 13. Now there are some that will have a two year lead in time and there will be others where the lead in time is just one year. And, and this is something just to, to be aware of. And no matter what they say on their particular websites or how complicated they make the whole admissions process look, there is a pattern here. And, and the overall, what schools are doing is they are setting a preliminary test as a main filter. A number of you will be familiar with what is called the ISEB, that's the Independent Schools Examination Board, pretest. And this is probably the key test for age 11 plus and 13 plus entry. UCASET 
is a, a, a test that was uh, designed about six or seven years ago as a, a potential entry test for UK um, schools, UK independent schools as well. It's very similar to the ISEB pretest. And then, of course, certain schools have their own individual pretest, but all of them are based on verbal, nonverbal, and mathematical reasoning. They're very similar to CAT4 or any other standardized test that you come across. A number of them, ISEB and UCASET included, have um, an extra part, which is a bit of extended English writing uh, as well. But this is the key test because if your son or daughter gets through this particular test, then the school actually wants to take the vast majority of those pupils on board. They recognize that some may be looking at different schools and so will pull off their particular list. But once, once you are through that particular hurdle, the school is saying to you, yes, you are of the right standard to come through to us. Now, all that you have to do is follow that up with a reasonable outcome in our particular school assessment. Now, there, there are variations in this. Some schools wrap it all into one. Um, some of the girls' schools, for instance, have an assessment day. And that assessment day, under normal conditions, means that you spend a day at the school doing the standardized test, having interviews, working in group activities, and so on. And at the end of that, you've more or less got your outcome. And a school, a school like Wickham Abbey, for instance, will say, at that point, we will make X number of offers, and we would hope that all of those will accept. And then if there is a second stage of school assessment later on, it's of almost of lesser importance. Now, at um, 16, sorry, I, 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 I put this slide in uh, as well, just because a number of people have been asking me, uh, have things changed just at the moment? So uh, a quick email to a number of school registrars. I, I got replies back from about 10 of them, but I just thought I would um, highlight Wickham Abbey and Winchester as I've been talking about them earlier. What they're, essentially what they're saying is that the, the process remains roughly the same, but you don't have to come to Wickham Abbey or you don't have to come to Winchester and the, uh, all of the exams are online, all of the interviews are online. And as Katrina Sutherland-Hawes from Wickham Abbey has said here, it has actually made it easier for overseas pupils as it is much more uniform now for everybody coming through. Um, the registrar at, at rugby school, Guy Steele Bodger, uh, said to me that actually one of the things that he has noticed is that there's been an increase in the numbers applying from overseas because the system is actually more straightforward and is more simple. Now, whether that means that uh, families are actually applying to more schools or not, I'm not really sure. And we won't know that until we come to the, the final uh, selection of school, the final selection of pupils. And one of the things that came through from Andy Shedden at, at Winchester was that he feels that, yes, it's terrific news about a vaccine, but it probably won't be ready in time to change anything, certainly for this coming year. And what schools will try to do for the following year is they will probably try to mix the best of what they've seen in terms of their online provision with the whole notion of making sure that they get to see everybody, if at all possible, uh, through uh, the process. But, but I don't think that even with a vaccine, that things are going to become, uh, are, are going to get back to what we might call normal too quickly. Now at 16 plus, in some ways, this is much more straightforward. 16 plus entry allows pupils, as most of you will know, to join the school for A-levels or for the IB for two years prior to moving on to university. 
uh, it can be a tremendous experience. And I uh, think that a number of schools do this part of education brilliantly, perhaps, perhaps even better than they do at IGCSE, which is at, at the lower level. Um, assessment at 16 plus, it's just an open competition. The lead in time is shorter. At maximum, it's a year in advance. I think Seven Oaks School is one of the very first to have a, um, one, of, one of the very earliest deadlines, which is the middle of August um, of the previous year. But most of the schools allow people to, uh, candidates to register right up into September of the year before entry. The examinations, generally speaking, are in October and November. And one of the things that we worked uh, very hard to do as a, a conference of, of uh, school registrars was to make sure that all of the schools were doing roughly the same thing at the same time. So the offers, uh, offers of places, certainly from the sort of major boarding schools, will appear on the 1st of December. The assessment uh, papers, the assessment procedure, generally runs along these lines that I've outlined here. There's usually some sort of common paper. The IB schools might say it has to be both maths and English. <clears throat> the A-level schools might say it is going to be uh, a general paper, which may be a mixture of logic, philosophy, um, a bit of extended writing, no right, no wrong answers, uh, and so on. And then they will add subject papers onto that. A-level schools very often add uh, two subject papers. The IB schools often add the three higher tier papers that uh, people are, are, are the higher tier subjects that people are considering studying. So the application deadline very often <clears throat> September, even October of the year before, exams in October, November, offers on the 1st of December. That is, if you like, the first round. The most popular schools will aim to fill all of their places at that particular point. Many of the schools will have a, a, a second round and they may, many of them will have vacancies later on as well that are just filled as and when the right candidate appears. Now, it's not just about um, academic ability. Yes, that's important, and, and, and that, in a, in a way, is the first hurdle. But schools are also looking for what these individuals will bring to a boarding community. And I, I well remember interviewing a girl many years ago. She was at a, a UK boarding school already. She wanted to transfer. And I, I remember just writing on the file, she will get A grades in all of her subjects, but will contribute nothing to the school. She had no, nothing of interest to add to the community. And schools would prefer to take on somebody who has got something a bit extra. It, of course, it can be music. In fact, I didn't want to put um, a big music image here because in a way that's very predictable. Um, yes, indeed, they are looking for uh, applicants who, who can offer music, drama, sport, but other things are of interest as well. I, I well remember uh, two boys from Hong Kong, one who came through to me when I was registrar for admissions. I was fascinated by this boy. He was, an, um, he was a nationally ranked indoor climber in, in Hong Kong. And he, he ticked all of the other boxes as well. He was good fun to talk to. He was academically pretty strong. Um, but I was fascinated by this idea that he, he was such a good climber. And what was really interesting was the impact that he had. As it happened, he joined the school at the same time as the son of an Alpine climber. And I was delighted to see that the head of the combined cadet force at the, at the school had taken a group off to Spain for rock climbing uh, during one of the Easter holidays and both of these boys ha had gone. I remember another boy that I was dealing with uh, just a few years ago who was applying to a range of different schools. They were really struggling to work out which schools to apply to. 
he was a really interesting scientist. He was, he was really an engineer, an inventor. And he already had been involved in science competitions, had won um, national science competitions, had gone on to international competitions as well. Uh, he, by the time he moved to his UK school, he had already patented one of his inventions. And it was inevitable that he would go to a school that had a very, very strong engineering department. So schools are looking for genuine interest um, and, and of course, genuine talent. I used to come out to Hong Kong every year uh, to interview uh, boys and, and girls who were, who were coming through. And my director of music would come with me. And he used to talk about musicality, not just training, but musicality. And in a, in a way that can apply to any particular area. And the schools are genuinely interested in boys and girls who have a particular fascination or a particular interest, whether that be reading, writing, um, art, drama, whatever it happens to be. Um, I, I remember another boy who was just uh, obsessed with fossils. He was a fossil hunter. And, and again, it was something that we were able to talk about and discuss and he thought that he would love to be part of a paleontology group at the school. And I, I just liked this, this attitude. So interest and talent outside of the curriculum is always important. Now, some, if, if I'm going to stress that, then one of the things that you should as parents consider, and I certainly do, is are there particular schools that we should be considering for a boy or a girl with particular talents? Now, this, this is not um, uh, an exhaustive list at all. I just simply put in a few random names here. That, for instance, many of the schools have really good music departments. But if I had a son or daughter who, who was so good that they might be even borderline um, uh, professional music school, then I would want some of these like King's Canterbury, Wells Cathedral, uh, Mayfield as a girls school. I'd want them to be on the list somewhere. I wouldn't only look at those particular schools because I think music is done um, very, very well in, in other boarding schools as well. And likewise with, with drama, <clears throat> my own daughter went on to study uh, English and uh, drama uh, when, when she left school, both in the, uh, in the UK and in, in the US. But if film was part of the interest, if, if this was somebody who had a real interest in the technology of uh, behind drama and film, then I would look at a school like Hertwood House, which is actually just a sixth form uh, boarding school. And then for art, the art departments across these schools are just wonderful. Fine art at rugby, at um, uh, Uppingham, their art departments are stunning. I, I love the fact that when you walk around uh, Radley uh, College, that you, you just see the pupils' art just coming at you off the walls everywhere in, in the school. But probably the finest art department, there's a, a photograph of it here that I have seen is at Beedales, where they don't just cover A-levels in art, but they actually do the foundation course, which means you can go straight on into art college if that's what you want to do. And of course, when it comes to sport, Millfield must be there somewhere. If your son or daughter is really talented in, in, in the world of sport, you should at least consider Millfield. You may not go there, but at least have a look. And likewise, engineering at Oundle is just extraordinary. And so just as there are schools out there for pupils that have particular talents, there are of course different schools for, for different pupils. And th there is not a one size fits all here. Now, personal statements. <clears throat> In the American system, personal statements are hugely important. To be honest, at age, particularly for 11 plus and 13 plus entry, they're not very relevant in terms of UK boarding schools. 
we would not really expect these youngsters at age eight, nine, 10 to write a personal statement. What is much more important is that somebody puts together a candidate profile in, in the, the language that a school registrar or an admissions tutor will understand. It, it does not have to be a huge portfolio. What it does need to be is probably um, less than, than one side, probably 300 words on a, a particular pupil, just outlining uh, his or her academic level, his interests and so on. Now, at 16 plus it changes. The personal statement is hugely important. And again, there's a little warning here. There's too much adults and expert interference can change the tone of the, uh, of, of the personal statement. And remember that what we're actually hunting for and what we're look, listening for is the voice of that 15 year old. Because if they are applying for a 16 plus entry, they're just going to be 15 when they write this. And we want to hear the adolescent uh, teach, uh, talking to us. And, and yes, of course, we can guide them in terms of what should be in there. Very often, they don't understand the importance of half of what they do. So yes, they can have guidance. And yes, you can um, improve it to a certain extent. But don't feel that it should always be in perfect adult English. And one of the great reasons for writing um, a personal statement is that it's an opportunity, as I've said here, to set the agenda for interview. Interviews are important at every age level. And the, um, a, a good interviewer will be able to get under the skin of uh, any youngster who's, who's actually applying. And I remember when I was um, interviewing at Oxford, for instance, we would always go to the personal statement first. We would highlight those two or three areas that we thought were of interest. And then we would allow the candidate to talk about those particular topics. And so it is an opportunity to set the agenda. It's an opportunity for you as the candidate to say, I am really interested in A, B and C. And so if you are really interested in A, B, and C, I'd like to talk to you about that. And that is the attitude of, of any uh, school registrar. At age 16 plus, it is likely that you will have two interviews. So one of them might be based on your personal statement and then can lead off into different areas from that. The other might simply ignore the personal statement and just uh, look at, at other areas. Some schools divide up the interviews of this age level into a sort of academic and pastoral. Others just simply mix the two together. Some have group interviews. Some have group activities. It, it just depends on the individual school. Now, I wanted to um, uh, put this slide together towards the end, uh, just to say that I, I have been talking about the idea that different schools offer different things. And um, I, I was talking to this particular school, which happens to be B Dales, which I've mentioned in, in terms of art, where they have set up a new course, a Living with the Land course, um, which there is a demand for. People are interested in the environment. They're interested in where their food comes from. And this school has always had its own farm, it's had its own pottery, its own bakery. The uh, pupils learn to build. Um, so it's, it, it's quite different. It, it sounds a little bit alternative, but they do offer A-levels. And um, this, this is something uh, quite new. I, I just like um, the style of, of what they're doing here. Okay. so. The, how, how, we can, how we can help, well, th there are programs which Baker and Bloom have got running, and you're probably uh, aware of some of those. Specifically, as far as I'm concerned, we offer um, test preparation. Sometimes that is very, very detailed in terms of, of actual tutoring. Sometimes it's just general guidance. Where do you get the resources to... Um, practice and prepare for the ISEB pretest or for UCASET. 
how should you go about writing a particular essay and so on. Um, it, it can uh, become much more um, in, intense in terms of subject uh, preparation and so on as well. Personal statements we've talked about, but yes, we do offer uh, guidance, whether that be for um, entry into American boarding schools or to UK schools or even for university. Portfolio support, art and music. This, this can be a tricky area because what the schools are hunting for is to gain an understanding of the artistic ability of somebody, not whether they can actually produce a, a beautifully finished and framed piece of art or music, but can we actually demonstrate their uh, artistic ability in both of those areas? Interview preparation, it's very dangerous to suggest to youngsters that there are right answers and wrong answers um, and, and that there are certain questions that they need to be prepared for. Any interviewer will try to take them off track, off piste, and um, try to throw different ideas at the uh, individual pupils. And what is so important here is to encourage the individual pupils to be themselves, to be honest, to be open, and to be able to let their personality uh, come through. And, and then as we go forward through their time at school and even on to university, we can move on to a, a tutoring, coaching, uh, support level there if that is what is needed. So that's where, where we are today. I know that it was um, a bit of a skim through the um, whole idea of UK boarding. I hope it's helped you and if you do have any questions please uh, do send them through. And again, as I said at the beginning, a big thank you to Phil and the team at uh, Baker and Bloom for uh, putting this on. Now, I don't see any questions here at the moment. Um, Phil is probably listening in uh, to me and I don't know if there are questions coming through, Phil. Uh, not at this moment, so we'll give it another minute. Uh, okay, or so. okay. For people to type them up. A comment from Fei Chen. Thank you for the uh, nice overview. Oh, that's a that's a nice question. How do you think UK boarding schools and US schools are different? I, I think that's rather like um, saying, how do you think the UK and the US is different? I, I often see um, UK schools as being um, th th there's that sort of American energy that um, is often almost uh, overstated in, in, in sort of um, my, um, not, not so much judgment in, in, in my view, and the, the English schools are often that bit understated. I think the biggest, the, the reason perhaps for choosing a UK boarding school or a US boarding school is all about familiarity. It's about what resonates with you. Does an American uh, system where you're working towards your um, average points grade the whole way through, you're working towards an SAT, ACT system, um, and then the uh, process into a more general uh, undergraduate degree. I, I think that's, that's quite different to the, the UK system where at age uh, 16, 15, 16, you do the IGCSEs and you get uh, assessed at that particular point. And then you move on towards A-levels and everything hangs on the grades that you will get in that final exam. Very often, um, UK students who are applying to American universities find it quite odd that it doesn't really seem to matter what grades they get at the end. But 
of course, the ACTs or the SATs will, will be very important there. Um, I think Karen and I could put together a, a, a talk on uh, how we think the UK boarding schools and the US uh, ones are different. I think it could be a talk all in its own right. But, but I think it's much more a societal um, difference than a, a terrific educational difference. Right, anything else coming through at this stage? Does that look like it, Phil? Yeah, that's, uh, I guess we'll work on it. That. <laughs> uh, thank okay. you, Rory, for doing this talk. Not uh, at I really all. appreciate it. Not at all. And, and as, as I said, if anybody has particular um, emails... Oh, ah, looks like I have another question. There's, there's one question coming through. What are the biggest gaps to close for UK graduates to apply to US universities and vice versa. Now, when um, every year there, there's a major conference in London um, for both advisors and for uh, candidates applying to American universities. And um, at, one of the, um, at one of the sessions where I, th I think it was the it was the tutor for admissions from Harvard, and she was talking to the whole group of, of advisors and people like me. And I very deliberately asked her if there were, if it was an advantage to be in the American system or more of an advantage to be in the IB system or in the A-level system. And she was very keen to make the point that they are very familiar with applicants coming through from these different educational systems and felt that there was no great advantage in one over the other. Now, one of, one of the biggest difficulties uh, facing IB students is that when they are at an incredibly busy stage of their course, um, completing their uh, central um, extended essay, at the very same time, they are trying to complete their application to individual American universities. Um, are there gaps to close? I'm not certain that there are gaps to close. I think that a UK student, uh, a UK school student, is well prepared for life at an American university. I think what is, diff what is difficult for them is to understand the difference in the um, application process. And the, uh, the, the application process for American entry to American universities is simply much more extensive. And so are there, are there other issues coming from America to, uh, to UK universities? Um, again, the universities have to be familiar with the American education system, and most of them are. Um, the assessment uh, procedure has to be slightly different. Um, but in terms of curriculum content, I, don't, I, I, I really don't think that there, that there should be a particular problem. I mean, my own daughter went on to, uh, to study at Yale, but that was um, uh, in the Master of Fine Arts program. And what she found was that the expectation at an American university is that you are going to be taught, you are going to be in classes much more than at a British university. At a British university, you'll have your lectures and seminars and so on, and then we'll be told and, and go off and read all about it. Whereas 
an, an American university is still rather like that final year of, of boarding school. So, so there is that sort of difference in approach. Um, I, I think uh, apart, from, apart from that, the other big difference is that uh, British universities, when you've got to the age of 18, they feel you are now a young adult, so you make the decisions. Whereas because American universities are, or because American society has a slightly different approach and the, you, you can't drink alcohol until you're 21 in, in quite a number of states and, and so on, they also at university feel as though they are responsible for you as an individual. And so there is um, al almost what we would feel is a school-like uh, as a high school-like approach to the students, particularly in their first couple of years. They are perhaps looked after more, perhaps they are supervised more. Whereas I, I often used to say to my A-level um, uh, pupils, you know, remember that when you get to university, you're going to have to act like an independent uh, student. You, they're not going to worry whether you get out of bed or not in the morning, that's up to you. Whereas I think the American universities have, have a much more hands-on um, approach. I'm, I'm not certain that that actually answers um, your question, Alex, but um, it's sort of an attempt. I uh, see the question also covers the idea of uh, sports as, as well. American universities, as we know, are sort of obsessed with, with sport and, and they organize it incredibly well. At the, the British universities, it varies so much from university to university and within the universities, from individual to individual. They, um, when, when I was interviewing at, at Oxford, they were often worried that an individual might just want to spend all of his time rowing on, on the river and would, wouldn't have enough time for the, their academic work. Um, um, but I think when you go to a UK university, you decide what it is you want to get involved in, rather than the university saying this is what you should be doing. Anything else coming through? <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Yes, I, I, I know Yale has a wonderful fi fine art program as well. My, my daughter was in the School of Drama there and um, is now living the dream in, in New York. Um, but yes, she, she, she had a wonderful time there. Very hard work, but uh, enjoyed her, I think, three years at, at Yale. Okay, any other questions? Um, no worries. Uh, if you have more questions, you can also uh, email us uh, right here on the screen, info at bmb.edu.hk. Um, if you just all of a sudden think of a question that you didn't get to ask just now, uh, feel free to email that and we'll deliver it to Rory. Uh, so thank you, but thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we'll call it a day. Yes, thank you all. I think it's uh, coffee time now in, here in the UK. Okay, bye-bye for now. Bye thanks everyone. very much, Phil. Thank you.